Well, uh, good morning, and uh, welcome to the adult class. We are studying the book of Proverbs together. We are in the 21st chapter, and we are at the 8th verse. Uh, it's great to be with you, and it's always a blessing to be back at Believer's Chapel. Here are a number of Proverbs I have for you. Six from 8 to 13. Proverbs 21. The way of a guilty person is crooked, but as for the pure, his deed is straight. 9. Better to dwell in the corner or on the corner of the roof than a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. 10. A wicked person craves evil. His neighbor does not find favor in his eyes. There's that familiar word favor that we've talked about throughout the Proverbs. And here it is not happening to the neighbor. Eleven. Through punishing a mocker, the guilty becomes wise, and through paying attention. Now, we have this verb in both 11 and 12, paying attention, uh, to become aware, to become knowledgeable of. By paying attention to a wise person, he gains knowledge. Now, this is a very, very difficult problem. I mean, it is a grand canyon of a proverb. Because the word knowledge here is not the word that is typically used for knowledge. It's not revelation, which we naturally would expect it to be. This is a different form of knowledge, and it requires a bit of thinking and a little bit of understanding from the Old Testament. So that's my job to explain that. Here's 12. The righteous one pays attention. Again, same verb. Two, that's supplied because it, there's not a real particle in the original text. To the household of the wicked. The one who casts down wicked people to ruin. Now there's another big interpretive question here regarding verse 12. Who is the one? Is that uh, the righteous one? Is he the one? Is that the wise person? Or is that the Lord himself? So it's an interpretive question. And here is 13. Whoever shuts his ears to the cry of the poor. Indeed. Now that is a particle that is emphatic. So we translate that indeed. This is an exclamation point in the proverb. He himself will cry out and not be answered. So it is uh, for you to know exactly what's going to happen to the wicked who will shut his ears to the cry of the poor. All right, here's the way we're going to teach these Proverbs, beginning with 21.8. Uh, a contagious conduct. Verse 8 is a contagious conduct. Verse 9, solitude is sometimes needed for peace. That's very practical, isn't it? Solitude is sometimes needed for peace. Just get away. Get away, get out, whatever. And then here's 10. The wicked, his thoughts are only on himself. That's 24-7. 365 days a year. Common denominator of the fool, the wicked. His thoughts are only on himself. Here is 11. And this is a rather difficult proverb because there's a lot of questions 
that we don't have enough information to be clear about. But here's the way I'm teaching it. Seeing eyes, hearing ears, that learn. Seeing eyes, hearing ears, that learn. Twelve, the Lord sees and knows and brings the wicked to ruin. The Lord sees and knows and brings the wicked to ruin. And finally, 13, another full circle proverb of sowing and reaping. Another full circle proverb of sowing and reaping. Well, here is our exposition for our class this morning, beginning Proverbs 21, verse 8, the way of a guilty person. I hope you're beginning to see, as we go through these Proverbs, we have a very limited vocabulary. So when we see these words, we have instant recognition and hopefully an easier way to interpret them. Uh, We recognize our top line, the word way past life, current day existence, and apart from being a fool or a wise, it is your future. It's already determined. Here it is. It's laid out before you and it's called a way. Your determinative behavior. And this is the way of the guilty. The term guilty, they're already judged under the law of Moses. So, they are sentenced by God himself. They are covenant breakers, no hope for them. They're guilty. And in the word crooked, we've recognized that word. We talked about it a number of times, and specifically used by David, Psalm 18, that the crooked fool is the twisted man, and... uh, The point David makes there in Psalm 18, no matter what his schemes are, his folly, his practice, the Lord always has the upper hand. He always knows what's next for the wicked. And so putting line one together, the wise, the skillful, they recognize the crooked way of the fool's life. The way of the righteous, for them, for the wicked, why, it's an abomination. And that's what Peter says, doesn't he, in the New Testament? They mock you, ridicule you, because you don't pick up with the former way of life, and therefore your companionships are severed. You become a religious fanatic. And they want nothing to do with you. So, line two, but, our contrast, pure refers to the moral purification of the law of Moses. And what you think about it is the perfect offset to this word guilty, where one is sentenced by the law, the moral code of God, and the fool is the covenant breaker. But here, line two, look, the righteous are purified, cleansed from sin in their way, by their daily conduct and by their participation in the law of Moses going as they do and the requirements of the law continually to get sacrifices through the Old Testament system, but for us, there are no more sacrifices. We are now the priests. No longer priests for the Old Testament. We're the priests. And we, we go directly to our high priest who makes intercession for us and who forgives us of our sins. And once again, it's the gospel. It's uh, not only the gospel of John, but 1 John. How do we know who the believer is? Well, he's the one that's continually confessing his sin. 
And that's what we do. We are constantly being need to renew our relationship with Him. So we're the purified ones. And that is the wise of the Old Testament. Remember we've so long quoted uh, Job 29.14, I put on righteousness as my clothing. And it suddenly dawned on me, you know, 21 chapters into the book of Proverbs, and I've quoted this text over and over again, but I never really meditated on it. I never thought about it. It's what you have to do. You have to think about the words and how they're used. I put on righteousness as my clothing. That was his way. That was his life. Okay, so practically speaking, I see you have a new dress. Is that a new tie you're wearing today? Your dress is the distinguishing feature of what I see. It catches my attention. Now, does my righteousness, my manner, my way, catch your attention? It should. It should be one of the noticeable factors of my life. That's the idea. The New Testament idea of this, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul exhorts us, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Imitation, the impressionist, Rich Little, Dana Carvey, why, when they imitate you, that's the highest form of flattery. And what do we see when we see the imp impressionist? We don't go, well, there's Rich Little. No, we, we don't do that. We actually see the person that he is imitating. And he doesn't even have to introduce him to us. We automatically know by his manner, his voice, his style. What did Paul say? Imitate me. Because I'm imitating Christ. Wow. How am I in my speech? How am I in my liberality? How am I in my kindness and generosity to others? Do people see Christ in me? They should. They should if I'm following Him. You know, they identified the apostles in the New Testament as men who had been associated with Him. There was a distinctive about them. And that should be our way, our daily conduct. Look at how the proverb ends. Straight deeds. Straight, moral course, transparent before all, unattainted by duplicity. The wise are to be a blessing to people. Now, through the help of Alan Angelus, I have gotten to know uh, a pastor in Oklahoma City. Pastors, a Mexican congregation. And I found out just recently that he and his wife, his wife cleans houses, he has two jobs, and then he pastors his church. And uh, I found out that there you have saved money for over three years to go to Mexico. And they want to give back to the Christian community whatever they've saved. And they want to be there at Christmas to be a blessing to them. I have uh, given this man a lot of reform uh, texts, books, uh, in the Spanish language, and have used Alan as really the conduit back and forth to communicate with him. Uh, when I found out about this, their savings for over three years to go back and do this mission work in their community, I, I thought this would be a great opportunity to talk to him once again about what changed my heart as a Christian, Reformed theology, Galvanism. And I wanted to make that really clear to him. So, 
through Alan's help, I met with him again. And I explained to him, look, this is the Lord's work. So here's how the Lord works. All the money you've saved, set aside, you don't use it. God is the one who provides. That's what Abram told his son. Remember going up that mountain? Genesis 22. The Lord will provide. And he does. Start to finish. You're not to use your money. The money is taken care of. The plane tickets that you bought, taken care of. The expenses that you've set aside out of pocket, that's done. The Lord, this is His work. He doesn't need our help. This is what He does. And this is His activity. And my, my point, my, my hope was to really teach him Reformed theology and the right way to think about these things, that God is the one who provides always. Well, I spent an hour, hour and a half in their home through translation. I got in the car after they had cried, hugged one another. I said, you know, Lord, that man's half my age and he's better than me in every way I can measure a man. But see, that's the kingdom. That's the kingdom. And I can't think of anything, anything more exciting to be a part of, to be close to, than that. Look at the close of the proverb. The wise are to be a blessing. And that's what we should be to one another in our communication, in our contact, in every form of communion and fellowship with one another. Here's nine. The contentious wife. And I had lunch yesterday with Dennis Monroe. And he warned me about this contentious wife. You better be careful, he said. A better than proverb. Dennis didn't realize that I'd done my homework in preparing for this lesson. I am happy to announce to you that not only has wisdom broken out in my own home, in my own heart, but it has actually spilled out into the life of my son and into the life of his son. He sent me this the other day, crinkled up homework from the back seat of his car. Question, who is your hero? Dad. Why do you consider this person your hero? Because he is brave. Is there anything your hero would be afraid of? Mom. <laughs> I'm careful with the contentious wife. Believe me. You recognize instantly here the contrast. It's the flat roof, no gables, no cathedral ceilings. Uh, to the contentious wife. Inside the home. Our top line, this word to dwell. It's a great Old Testament word. Now here is something that I have adapted as I've been teaching the book of Proverbs. I have tried to use these words as a point of reference to help me to memorize Scripture. So, for example, here's the word to dwell. I think of Psalm 91. Verse 1, he who dwells, there's the word, in the secret place of the Most High. Uh, Psalm 37, dwell, there's our word, dwell in the land, enjoy safe pasture. Psalm 21, I will dwell, said David, same word, in the house of the Lord forever. You might try that and help you to memorize Scripture. The word means a place of space, of inhabitants, 
corner here, a solitary place, a place of exposure, and that would mean, of course, discomfort. And this word roof, what is that? That's the flat surface. 11 2, 2 Samuel, that's where David walked out on the flat surface and saw Bathsheba. Line 2, notice the translation in a house. Those three words indicate abode, a place. It is a place to be shared. See that? A place to be united. That's Psalm 122, verse 3. Jerusalem built as a city, and here's our word, joined together, united together, compactly built, says the psalm. And then this word, con, con, quarrelsome, contentious, well, it's not just for the woman. It's the same word that's used for the man as well. Proverbs 26, 21, as charcoals for ember and wood for a fire is a quarrelsome man for kindling strife. So it's really just an attitude. And that's what is being highlighted here in the proverb. Remember back in the days of black and white television and when you could uh, have magazines and you would open them to all these cigarette ads. And remember the Tarleton cigarette? It always had the black eye and the Band-Aid over the eyebrow. And their, their theme, their national campaign, I'd rather fight than switch. Well, that's what they're talking about here. The contentious person, they, they just enjoy getting into it. And that's not wise. That's, that's foolish behavior. And people like that you need to avoid because they're not beneficial and they don't encourage and build up. And that's what we should be really all about. Here's 10. A wicked person craves evil. Here's a proverb that gives us a lesson in theological anthropology. I need to be careful. Dan is here. Mark is here. Uh, elders are listening. So I'm going to give you a short version of biblical anthropology. Man is totally depraved. I don't need to tell you what that means. Your people at Believer's Chapel, you know. But if anyone is visiting, here's just the cliff notes. It means that man is not as bad as he could possibly be. We're not all uh, mass murderers, liars, cheats, etc. What total depravity really means is as a result of the fall in the garden, back in Genesis 3, that man became totally depraved, and that meant he was dead spiritually. He died spiritually from that point forward. Uh, his life was cut off. That's a good Old Testament term. He's cut off from the land of the living. No vitality. And I think that was what Jesus was alluding to in John with the vine and the branches. That the branches that are cut off, severed, they are going to be picked up and thrown in the fire. There's no vitality. There's no life there. And he was using an important Old Testament allusion that they should have picked up on and understood. Paul, Ephesians 2, calls it spiritual death. And in the behavior of what spiritual death produces, transpa transpa uh, transpasses in sins. It means that man is unable of himself to link up with God in any way, shape, form, or fashion. No Roman masses will do. No good works will do. Humanitarian aid and so forth. No Muslim martyrdom will give an ability for a man to stand. Now that's an Old Testament concept. 
The righteous must stand before the Lord. But the wicked cannot stand because they have no ability. And that's the idea. That's Psalm 1, verse 5. The wicked shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The righteous will stand. They have the ability. Their hope is in the Lord and the Lord only, not in themselves. And thus, man is hopeless and helpless. That's what total depravity means. You're driving down a road and you see the squad car from a distance. The lights are spinning and you get closer and closer and now you make everything out and it's the sheriff. And you slow to a complete stop. And he comes over to the window and he says, I'm sorry, you can go no further. The bridge is out. That's total depravity. You can't get on the other side. It's impossible. You can't be a bridge. And the bridge is out. And that's total depravity. So that is the wicked man. And we've studied much on him. Here he is, line one. Selfish, self-centered. The world, his day, is constantly absorbed with himself. That's the wicked man. That's the life he lives. And in his thoughts, which lead to deed, determine his destiny. Pollution determines his own appetites. Now, this is that interesting word in the proverb, craves. It means to desire. Here's how it's used. 2 Samuel 2.16, it was used of the wicked sons of Eli the priest who, when they brought the sacrifice to the altar, they craved the best portion of the meat. That's the word. It was used of the children of Israel who desired, craved a king like all the other nations in the world. And God said to Samuel the prophet, don't get angry at them. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. That's the word. It's not a good word. It's a word that says you are idolatrous. You are fleshly. You have your eyes in the wrong place. And your attitude is wrong. Look at line two. Neighbors, as we know them in the Proverbs, third party. That's the man on the street. No favor. We know that favor only comes from God. And favor is an act of kindness. But it's not in his eyes, not the wicked. Meaning his thoughts, where the wicked man makes his own determinations about life. No. No one is worthy for favor. This neighbor. And therefore he received no esteem, no acceptance. If he is kind... He has got something in it for himself. Believe me. That's his motive. One commentator writes, instead of helping his neighbor, he brutalizes him. Wow, that's a powerful word. Charles Bridges in his Old Testament commentary on Proverbs writes, no man is regarded at, we could say, considered of any value who stands in the way of a wicked man's own interests. See, that's paramount. My interests. My interest first. And here there's no favor in opposition to the full extent of what the flesh desires. Here's 11 very hard proverb. Um, it is... Uh, a proverb that's grammatically complex. We have a twofold process of education for the simple and the naive. Now remember, the naive and the simple are the mildest form of the fool. So we have a couple of surprises here. Now first is this word punished, and second is this second line which would tend to support the conversion of the simple. 
And I'm going to leave it at that because I'm really not at all comfortable with it, but I'm going to teach it that way. Line one, here's the lesson. It is punishment, which is fining. That is dollars and cents. That is you owe. Um, here's the way the word is used. Second Kings 23:33 of the tribe of Judah paying a tribute to of silver and gold to uh, Pharaoh Necho. So it's a it's a tariff. It's a fee. Now remember the mocker. He's the hardened fool. We leave him alone altogether. He, you leave him alone lest he hates you. He cannot be redeemed. Proverbs 13, 1. Don't correct a mocker. <clears throat> Stay away from him. Hard-hearted. But here is the possible transformation of the naive spiritually by reproving this mocker, this incorrigible fool, monetarily. See the naive go, wow, did you see the amount of fines he had to pay for his behavior? Suddenly he begins to think about things and they become different in his eyes. It becomes wise, is what the proverb says. See line two, he gains knowledge. Now here's really the second surprise that makes this proverb so difficult. Because this term is used for the regenerate, the one who practices wisdom. And we would say he practices wisdom by the power of the Holy Spirit for the believer in the New Testament. But look at line two. This is so difficult through paying attention. Now the lexicon translates this phrase the wise learner in the school of wisdom. That's the translation that uh, the standard Hebrew lexicon gives to this. So here, this naive person is going to depart from evil and fear God. And that is, uh, that's what the text says. And I'm, that's the best I can do. I, I'll give you a text that I think could reference that. It's Psalm 119, verse 120. 119, 120, my flesh trembles for fear of you, and I am afraid of your judgments. Now that's a wise man. He's trembling. He's afraid of the judgments that could be levied against him. And that seems to be what we're having here. Here's 12. The righteous one, that's he, pays attention. There's that word again from verse 11 to acknowledge. And then we supply this particle that's missing from the text to the household of the wicked person. The one who casts down wicked people to ruin. Now here's the interpretive question as to the identity of the top line. Who is the righteous one? The liberals all take this righteous one to be the wise man but none of the believers. And I believe that the righteous one is a reference clearly to the Lord himself. Observe he in the top line is also the same that casts down. Now, the righteous man doesn't cast down to ruin. The righteous man avoids the mocker. He avoids the wicked and he is not interested in paying attention, which is what we have here in line one. So I think this is a clear reference to the Lord himself. He pays attention and he casts down. Line two, it is to ruin. 
That is the profile of the Lord. That's what He does to the wicked. Not a man, not a king who acts this way. Not in righteousness, not in wisdom. So here is line one. Righteousness, the Lord, not a man, who is qualified. Let's say that. The Lord Himself is qualified. He pays attention to the wicked. And here is another very difficult point to the proverb. This word is knowledge, and the lexicon translates it knowledge as a moral quality. Now that was hard for me. I hope it's easy for you. Because when I think of knowledge in the book of Proverbs, I'm thinking of revelation. This is God disseminating His Word to a person to make them wise. But that is not how the standard lexicon translates this word knowledge. It, they said, is a reference to a moral quality. Now, here's a text that would explain the moral quality. It's Genesis 2.9. In the middle of the garden was a tree of life and the tree of, and here's your word, knowledge. The knowledge of good and evil. See, it's a, it's a moral quality. This is the standard. This is not revelation. It's what it represents. And so it's the idea of observing And that is what the Lord is doing. Line one, he pays attention. And based upon God's moral knowledge, his moral character, he gives expression. Now, here's his expression. Psalm 2. He looks at the wicked, the wicked kings, they're going to take on the Messiah. They're not going to let him come and establish his rule and reign in the earth. And what does God do? He laughs at them. That's what he does. He laughs at the wicked. He scoffs at them. Because he knows by paying attention and by his own will and his moral character, that their end is total ruin. Knowing, because he understands the outcome of that way of life and thinking. Let me give you another text that I think might be helpful here. These are not easy proverbs. Uh, Exodus 3.19. Listen to what the Lord says at the burning bush to Moses. He says, But I know that Pharaoh will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. Now think about that. God is telling Moses exactly the three links of the chain in the book of Proverbs. Thoughts, that lead to deeds that determine destiny. And so, God says, based upon the moral character of this man, Pharaoh, against my standard, this man is utterly going to ruin. And that's the point of knowledge. It's the knowledge that God represents. It's a fact. So, line one, household, that's the line of, the progeny of. Remember the word account in the book of Genesis? That's the generations of. The King James translates it begets. We have all those begets. In 2 Samuel 7, the Lord says to David, I'm going to build you a house. It's not, a, it's not 1305 Covington Lane. No, this is the king's 
These are the lines of people. And the righteous one is one and the same. The Lord who built the house is the one who's going to cast down here. Meaning he's going to subvert. Meaning he's going to turn upside down. Now, that's what the Lord does. That's what he does. He turns it all upside down. That's the kingdom. The first are going to be last. The last are going to be first. The ones that are so important today are going to be gone tomorrow. And we need to live in light of that. We need to think about that. That's truth. That's reality. He turns everything over. He turned me over. Everything I, I thought was important, not important. He's important. His kingdom is important. His work is important. And everything else is really secondarily from that. And you see, what I came to realize is that I was the money changer. I was living off Him. I was occupying His space in His place all for myself. And thanks be to God, He turned all that upside down for me. That's the word cast down. The righteous one cast down, subverts, it was used in the Proverbs for a bribe to turn upside down justice. But finally, look, the who, that is the wicked, are brought to utter ruin. The word means physical evil. The wicked are short timers. Here, then gone. And their futures based upon the people that they are is sealed. They're destined for destruction. Here's the way the Apostle Paul put it. Philippians chapter 3, verse 19. Their destiny is destruction. There it is. That's the end of the road. Their God is their stomach. Their appetites for today. The things that they crave. The things that they fill their minds and hearts with. All their activity, all their energy. Paul says their glory is their shame. Meaning they have nothing of value. It's here and it's gone and it perishes with them. Their minds, he said, are on earthly things. That's the wicked. That's the wicked. They are not interested in the kingdom. They're not interested in righteousness. They're not interested in glorifying God by their behavior, by their activity, by their conduct. They're interested only in themselves. And it's going to come to an end. And God is going to rule. And He's going to reign. And we're going to be with Him. And we, who are the nobodies, are going to be the somebodies. Not because of who we are. We're nothing. But because of who He is. Let me close by just making an appeal. Make your investment in Christ. That's the greatest way to live. That's the greatest way to spend the remainder of your life. Invest in Christ and His kingdom because it's going to last forever and ever. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for uh, our time of study this morning. Um, very, very difficult proverbs. Um, hard for this... Uh, Gentile to understand, but 
The righteousness and the kingdom are the truth. And, uh, and that's what we want to hear. We want to hear your voice. Not the voice of the speaker. We want to be your people for a time such as this that you would be glorified forever. And it is to that end that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.